Good morning, Faith family. Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning,
other side. Scripture points this out to him. You look at, at the, the children of Israel coming out of the bondage of Egypt. He parted the Red Sea and they went where? To the other side. You look at Joshua when he comes out of the time to the land of Canaan. What did he do? He parted the Jordan River and they went to the other side. We serve a God that is a crossing over God. We serve a God that will bring you into the destiny and the purpose that he has for us. But we got to trust him. Now, as we look at this, I can, I can just see this passage of Scripture come alive in our lives. And we want to encourage ourselves in the Lord this morning as we look at this. But we we got a God that He began a good work in us. And that God will continue, the Bible says. And we can be confident in this. That He will continue that good work until Jesus comes again. Yeah. Now, as we think about this, as we begin to look at this, and He's not a halfway God. And, you know, you ever heard this phrase? We want to look at it. storms. We're talking about storms. And anybody, can you anybody just kind of complete this phrase for me? When it rains, it pours. It pours. There you go. You probably said this. You probably have heard this. Um, there have been songs written about this. There's a, a Morton saw that actually did an advertisement for this. You know, she was on all the little salt boxes for every little girl with an umbrella. The, and the Morton saw was pouring out the back. When it rains, it pours. And I think as we begin to understand that and look at that, that's kind of a household frame. And the idea of a household frame, household frame, and the idea behind that is that drama just keeps compounding. Things just keep happening. You ever had one of those days when something goes wrong and everything else just, just begins to dog go effect, just begins to snowball? We've had those days. We know that. And we look and say, ooh, when it rains, it pulls. And I think many times we walk through life and we see these seasons in our lives and seasons of, of when it rains and pours and, and I think we just adopted this paranoia. We've adopted this idea that something bad is always waiting around the corner. We just kind of, you know, you, you get a, a blessing from God, you get a good day and you just kind of wait and you think, you know, I, we said this at work before, we'll say, you know, boy, it sure is quiet today. And somebody will always say, well, it's the calm before the storm. You know, we live in that paranoia sometimes. We live yes. in the fact that something is going to happen. Amen. And that tells us, you know, that, we, that there is things that's going to happen. There's storms that's going to happen. And I think as we begin to look at this, it's hard to enjoy the blessings of God because we have this idea that they're not going to last long. That something else is going to Come, come our way and what we obsess over we just adapt, adapt our lives around it. We just kind of adapt our lives to the fact that well, it's going to get worse again or it's going to get bad or whatever. So we stop being men and women of faith. And this is what's really bad. We play it safe and we just deal with what we can control. If we can't control it, we don't we don't take a leap in faith. If we don't control it, we just play it safe. We're not risk taker. We just deal with what we can control. Amen. And I think if you begin to look at that, that's why the Bible says that the righteous just live by control, right? No. The Bible says the righteous just live by faith. So as we understand that, we have, we've got this idea of this this messed up concept that the Bible says that we're going to live by control. No, we're not. The Bible says we're going to be risk takers and we're going to be faith walkers and we're going to believe that God is able to take us into the next level of our life, into the purpose and the destiny that He has for us. But sometimes we have to take a step in faith to receive that. Yes, so we are, step, we are faith walkers. Now, as we understand this, I think so many times Many of us have just surrendered to life. Think about that. We have surrendered to life. To what life says we can have. To what life says we can do. To what it seems logical in our mind. What it seems just that, that we have control over. We have surrendered to that. And God says, I'm so much bigger than that. Why don't you surrender to me and let me take you to the next level of life? Now, as we begin to understand that, hold on to that, because some of you may need that in the end of the service. Now, many times I think we get angry with God. We get things happen, storms come, and we get angry with God. And I, that, that's okay, but we need to realize that why, why are we angry? I think about, I, I think about uh, John, I think about when God spoke to him, he said, do us not good to be angry. 
Do you have a reason to be angry? And as we look at this, we, we really get aggravated sometimes because God don't answer our prayers like we think He ought to. Amen. But we serve the God of the New Testament so we can get angry with God because He's the God that's full of mercy and He's the God that's full of grace. You know that sometimes you've got to be a little afraid of that Old Testament God. That you remember you go back in Scripture and read there was time that He would open up the ground and let people disappear. Amen. They just got like disappear. Yeah, uh, you got to be careful. You got to be careful with God. He's a sovereign God. But anyway, as you look at this, the disciples, they were on this boat. They were tired. They were rolling. Jesus don't went down below. He don't went to sleep. And they're going. They're rolling across. All of a sudden, here comes a storm. And they're rolling. And finally, they did everything they knew to do. Hold on to that. Did everything they knew to do. Because they, they knew both. They, some of them were fishermen. They knew both. They did everything they knew to do. And they did anything. If we parallel the scriptures this morning, Mark's Gospel gives us another account. His account of this in Mark's Gospel chapter 4. And we read this and we see here, he said that Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship. He was asleep on a pillow. And they woke him up and they said, Master, Get a hold of this last few words right here. You, sometimes you just got to read their emotions into this. Sometimes you just got to listen to what they're saying. You just got to kind of keep in context and understand where they just come from. Now this, these are not people that just have been floating along peacefully out there and everything just all of a sudden, he, he just going to walk down to the bottom of the ship and have a conversation with Jesus. Amen. These are people that have been rolling. These are people that have been struggling. These are people that have been battling the storm. And you know, when you get in a storm and when you get when you get frustrated and you get agitated, and all of a sudden you when you when you people you get an opportunity to talk to somebody, sometimes you'll be just a little bit, you know, to the point. Yeah. You'll be a little bit, you know, more profound than you normally would be. I'll get to these, you might even look at this, I even hear a little bit of bitterness in their words. Yeah. I hear a little bit of agitation in their word because he said, or they said, Master, do you not care? Do you not care that we perish? Here we are up here. Most of our rear ends trying to get this boat to the other side. You down here sleeping. That's what they're implying. Do you not care Amen. that we perish? So you see, they're a little bit frustrated with God. And I, I think if we <coughs> look at this, we get frustrated with God because we fail to realize or either we insulate ourselves to the idea that we shouldn't have storms in life. That everything should be perfect. We get this idea that when we get saved, there's, no, there's not going to be any more storms. Well, I don't know where we got that from. There's no scripture to back that up. There's a whole lot of scripture to the contrary on that. It is far from the truth. The Bible says it rains on the just as well as the unjust. Yeah. So what does that mean? That means that the Christians, the pure in heart, that means the one of those of us that are give our life to Christ, that means it's going to rain on us just like it does those that are not. Amen. God is no respect of a person. He rains on the just as well as the unjust. <clears throat> and we lash out to God and we question His love just like the disciples did. We question His love. Don't you care? God, if you really care, you wouldn't allow this to happen in my life. God, if you really cared, this would not be happening. God, if you really cared, you'd move this out of my life. And you know, as we say those words, it, it's, it's from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and that's what happens. It comes out. And I think as we begin to understand it, we need to have this idea going into life, the storms are going to come. Amen. We need to have this idea that it's going to rain. It's going to storm. There's going to be days. Sunshine? There's going to be days that's going to storm. And as we begin to look at this, you know, you think, man, I didn't come here to hear that kind of message this morning. I, I really, I, I was hoping to hear something positive. I got something positive. I'm positive that it's going to rain. Amen. I'm positive that it's going to storm. Amen. You can count on that. I'm very positive of that. John's Gospel chapter 16 verse 33 even gives us a little bit of a more insight to this. Jesus said this. He says, these things I have spoken unto you that you might have peace. In the world, 
You might have tribulation. No, that ain't what he said. In the world, you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So we didn't see anywhere in the scripture that Jesus says it's all going to be good. We see in scripture that you're going to have tribulation. We're going to have tribulation. We're going to have trials. We're going to have storms. We're going to have things that might set us back. We're going to have things and hiccups in life that might hinder us sometimes. Yeah. So as we see this, all throughout scripture, God's warning us that storms are coming. But we don't read the Bible based on what the Bible says. We read the Bible based on what we want it to say. And sometimes that's where we get messed up. We've got to really dig in sometimes and read the Bible. Because watch your Bible here. Romans 8, 28. Very familiar passage of Scripture. This is one of those verses we love. We love this verse. We quote this verse. We sing this verse. We preach this verse. We misquote this verse. And as we look at this verse, it says it this way. We know all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are called according to His purpose. We know all things work together for good for those that, are, that love God and are called according to His purpose. Think about it this way. How many cooks we got in here? How many people that can cook? I Be a weapon against us. Amen. Or that they wouldn't be a tongue 
against us. No tongue will rise against me. But that's not what it said. We begin, it says, actually, it says the exact opposite of that. It says, no weapon shall prosper. There's not a weapon that is formed against us that shall prosper, and there are all tongues that, that are <coughs> spoken against us that shall fail or fall. Now, as we understand that, we look at these passages of Scripture, and we see that God is saying, adversity is going to come. Trying times is going to come. Now, I, this is what gets me. So many times we just get all up in our feelings when storms come. But listen, church, we've been warned. We get all in our feelings and all upset and all been out of shape when storms come in our life. But we have been warned. It's a part of life. And in order to be able to get through this, we must learn how to survive storms. Yes. We've got to learn how to work through these things. And then yeah, here's the thing. Here's one of the things. Take a note. Don't make bad decisions when a storm comes. Because here's the thing. You got you can't think under pressure. You, you, you just think about that. You think about a time in your life where you've been under a lot of pressure. It's hard to make a good decision. Yes. You can't think when you're mad. Think about it. You can't think when you're mad because your mouth will think for you. You can't think when you're agitated. You can't think when you're bitter. So here's the thing. we got to get our mind right before we can get our thinking right. So when we get our mind right, we get our thinking right, and then we start making good decisions. So we set our mind right, get our heart right, then we think. Move that on. Another thing. As the disciples went below the boat there, they said, don't you care? Don't push Jesus away. You watch it. People, things will happen in people's lives. They'll quit coming to church. They'll get agitated. They'll give up on God. They'll lose faith. If there's ever a time in your life that you need God, it's during the storm. And as we begin to look at this, we begin to see that these are some of the most common things that we do during storms. In some storms, God gives us directions and, 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 and protocols and directives and things that we must do. Sometimes we build a boat. We know that. Noah. Prime example. He came to Noah and he said build a boat. He told these disciples, get in the boat. Sometimes we build a boat. Some storms God will get you in, some storms or get you out of, and some storms He'll walk you through. Yeah. Prime examples all through the Bible of that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember the king built a plan, uh, statue out there, a golden statue out there on the plains of Dura, told everybody they had to bow. These three Hebrew boys said, We're not bowing, we're not buzzing, we're not, we're not bowing. They, they, they fired up the band, everybody bowed, except these three Hebrew boys brought them before the king. He said, Listen here. He said, what? I don't know what's up with y'all. Y'all need to get with the program. He said, Because I built this statue out there. Everybody's going to worship the statue. Now this king, he said, well, I won't throw you in the furnace. He said, if you do what you got to do, we're going to do what we got to do. We ain't bound. He said, because here's the thing about it. He said, our God is well able to deliver us out of the hands of you. He said, if not, we still ain't bound. We still ain't buzzing. We know that story. They threw him in the furnace seven times hotter than it ought to be. And as we begin to see this, we begin to see that they should have been consumed the, the moment that they went in. But the king looked in there and said, I thought y'all threw three in there. I see four walking around and one of them looks like the Son of God. And as we begin to see, they brought them out of there and the Bible says they didn't even smell like smoke. Amen. Now you think about that. They some storms God will tell you to build a boat that you can get that you can sail through. And they some storms God will walk with you. And He'll walk through that storm <laughs> with you. And as we begin to understand that, we've got to really begin to grab a hold of how God thinks and what God wants from us. And as we think about that, <clears throat> that's why church can be so confusing sometimes. Especially the new converts. They look around and they see people. And they look at these people and they say, wow, those people got it all together. Those people, are, that they must be, everything must be good in their life. My life follows apart and they seem to be doing really good. If you're thinking that this morning, if you got that concept, let me let you in 
tell a little bit of secret. There ain't nobody in here got it all together. Amen. Nobody. I will say that again. If you want to ever think you got it all together, let me tell you, you ain't got it all together. Because they always pick up in our life. Yes. And as we begin to see this, we begin to see that while we can go and, and, and sit in church and look like this, is because we have a merciful God, because we have a gracious God, and when we go through the hiccups of life, when we go through the trials of life, when we go through the storms of life, we don't come out on the other side smelling like where we've been. Amen. Now, as we begin to understand this, we begin to see that sometimes God will send us a boat, tell us to build a boat, or sometimes He will walk through the fire with us. Now, you think about it. The only thing that, that we have is the grace of God, the mercy of God, and it covers us to the point that we can make it through life without having to look like or smell like or, or, or keep going through life acting like what we've been through. Proverbs 3.19 gives us a little insight on this passage of Scripture. I think it goes hand in hand here. It said, The Lord, by wisdom, hath founded the earth. By understanding, He hath established the heavens. I'm going to read that again. The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. Understanding, established the heavens. You say, well, what does that mean? Wisdom and understanding. Can I get a deeper read you for just a moment? Y'all ready to kind of dive into this for just a little bit? There's two dimensions that we live in at all times. We live in a natural. And a natural is something that we can experience with our senses. That's something that we can taste and touch and hear and see. We can take our five senses and we can experience the natural. But then there's a spiritual realm, a spiritual dimension that we live in. And if we understand this spiritual dimension, we have to experience it not with our senses, but through the power of the Holy Spirit that resides on the inside of us. So we've got these two dimensions in life that we're trying to, that we're trying to navigate through. So wisdom, it, it governs the natural. Wisdom gives us the, the ability and the knowledge to be able to navigate through the natural things in life. Understanding helps us to navigate through the heavenly or the spiritual things. So this tells me something. There's some things in life that prayer won't fix. He said, oh, wait a minute. Now, preacher, prayer will fix everything. There's some things in life that prayer alone just won't fix. Stay with me. Because you think about this. Prayer in and of itself will not fix a bad night. Think about it. Prayer within itself will not fix an unhealthy lifestyle. Y'all remember P90X? Anybody remember that little that video? Y'all saw the infomercials on TV. P90X, you order this thing, you can get you some, some, some rock solid abs, some biceps, and some triceps, and you can walk around looking all fit and all nice and, and look like you, 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 know, you, you, you just stepped off the cover of a muscle magazine or something. Let me just tell you, you can order that program, and a lot of people did. And a lot of people ordered it, they put it in their little DVD player, and they sat there on the couch with a bag of potato chips, and they watched it. <laughs> and you know what they looked like when they got through watching it? They looked just like they did when they started watching it. <clears throat> I was in school, I remember that this kid, he wasn't all together just right. <laughs> Remember Charles Atlas? Charles Atlas, you see these ads in the, in, in the paper and the magazine. Charles Atlas weightlifting course. This is for y'all older. <laughs> Some of y'all young people don't know what to do Charles Atlas was. Charles Atlas was a, he was a bodybuilder. And he had this weightlifting course. And this kid that's going, he ordered this thing. He said, he, he ordered the course and he looked through the, the page of the little pamphlet. He brought it to school. And he wrote and he got this thing and he read it. Read all the stuff that Charles Evans said he needed to do. And he didn't get the idea. He didn't have no weights at home. He didn't get the idea that you had to lift all these weights and do all this stuff. So he writes a letter back to Mr. Atlas disappointed. He said, 
Mr. Adams, I have completed your weightlifting course. Would you please send me my muscles? He was a little bit confused on how that worked. But I think as we understand this, there's something parents they're going to do that we're going to have to get up and take a step in faith. We're going to have to get up and move to be able to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. And we can pray about it and pray about it and pray about it. But if we don't ever move, then we'll never get accomplished. Amen. So as we see this, prayer don't fix bad diets and healthy lifestyles. It don't fix things like that. But there's certain things that we have to do. According to the wisdom of God, we must apply these things to our life. And as we do this, we engage into the wisdom and apply these things into our life. Then and only then will things get better. And some storms you build a boat, it's the wisdom. We build a boat, the wisdom gets us through the storm. Yeah. In other storms, we speak to the waves. And so, wow. In other storms, we speak to the waves that we've been going somewhere. So, as we think about this, it's not <clears throat> natural sometimes for us to be able to just go through life and things just fall into place. Sometimes we have to speak things like we mean things under the authority of God. And I think as we do this, we look at this passage of Scripture and we see that it's not, it was not natural for these winds and these storms to be hindering the disciples because most of the time they would just plow all through those things. They had been on the Sea of Galilee in some storms before. So it was not a natural storm that was just normal. This was a supernatural storm. Yeah. And sometimes it, it, the enemy is using things to block us from what God says we can have. So how do we know the difference? How do we know if it's a storm that we need wisdom or do we need understanding? Do we need knowledge and apply what God's given us or do we need the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to be able to push us through these storms? Here's the thing. The disciples have plowed through all night long. They had rode and rode and bailed and bailed. The Bible says the boat was filling up and they were in jeopardy. Is what the Bible says. When you've done everything you can do. When you have done all that you know to do. And you come to the end of yourself. And the waves are still crashing. And the wind is still blowing. Then you have applied the wisdom that God has given you. And at that point, you have to realize this is not a natural storm. This is not a storm that can be dealt with by wisdom. This is a storm that has to be dealt with with the supernatural power of the understanding of the Holy Spirit. And as we begin to look at this, we see that this storm that these disciples were in is a spiritual storm. They've done all they can do. The wind's still blowing. The waves are still crashing. And they wake up Jesus and they say, Don't you care? Don't you care? And this is really, if you read this passage of Scripture and you don't see Jesus' disregard for their question, you're reading the Bible all wrong. Because let's just look at this. As he, as he speaks to them, notice this. In verse 24, it says, And they came to him, and they awoke him, and said, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose, and he rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. Now, if you read that back in Luke's God, I mean in Mark's gospel, he says, don't you care that we're perishing? He just kind of blew their question off, disregarded their question. Now, I, I think as you see this, notice what he did. Understand, these disciples, they go down there, they're all up in an uproar, they're in the tizzy, they brought the stomping down in the, in the bottom of that boat. <clears throat> they're like, Jesus, you need to get up, but don't you care that we are about to die out here? Don't you care that we're about to be overtaken by the wind and the wave? Don't you care? And that would have been a good time for Jesus to clip their wings. Amen. But he didn't. <clears throat> he just disregarded them. He walked out on the path of life. <laughs> when you've got the wisdom, the solemn, the knowledge, the omniscience, the power of Jesus, you don't have to answer stupid questions. 
And that's why he looked at him like, do I care? Do I care? I really care. I'm going to show you how much I care. I'm going to care so much that I'm going to hold myself to die on the cross for me. That's how much I care. Amen. And y'all asking me a stupid question. Like, he didn't even respond to that. Uh, Jesus does that a lot through Scripture. Well, that's a life lesson to live itself right there. Just don't respond, respond to stupidity sometimes. But you know what we do? When somebody says something like that to us, our stupidity will come untucked sometimes. And we'll show ourselves. And we'll act just like them. And Jesus said, I ain't doing that. Because I'm above that. And I'm bigger than that. And as we begin to see this, he walked right on past them. And he didn't even say nothing to them. Because the questions just don't get answered sometimes. In verse 24, he stands up and he rebukes the wind. And he said, I can't hear what my master. <clears throat> we perished and he arose and he rebuked the wind, the raging of the water, and there ceased and there was a calm. Now, as we think about this. He looks at the disciples then in verse 25. And this is what he says. You know, he didn't say anything about them saying he didn't care. He just walked right on past them. He goes out, he says, fix it. He rebukes the wind and, the, and the, the way he rebukes it and there was a calm. He looks at them and he says, where's your faith? Where's your faith? He attacked their faith. And you know, you begin to look at that and you say, wow. Boy, that's pretty brazen right there. He just attacked their faith. He said, where's your faith? Now, as you take that into consideration, sometimes I have to really dig into the Bible and understand this. I'm like, okay, he attacked their faith. What was they supposed to do? Was there something that they were supposed to do in the storm? Was there something they were supposed to say? And I just have to ask God sometimes, God, what were they supposed to do? Put yourself in that boat. Put yourself in that situation. What were they supposed to do? And I kept reading that, and he led me to one word in that passage of Scripture. And as we look at this, you find it in verse 24. <laughs> I'll have to bring back it up. See. It said, <clears throat> and he rebuked. Rebuked. I read this word, rebuked. And I'm thinking, okay, God, what am I seeing here? What am I to learn from this word, rebuked? So I begin to look it up. I go to the strong concordance. I look it up in the Greek. It comes from a Greek word, epitome, which means to forbid or take charge of. Rebuke. It's listed about nine times in the New Testament. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around it. And all of a sudden, as I begin to read those nine times that it was mentioned in the New Testament, eight of those nine times, Jesus was dealing with demonic activity. And as I begin to look at that, I said Okay, Jesus, I get the demonic activity eight times, but what is demonic about the wind? And what is demonic about the waves? This looks like a storm. This looks like a normal storm. This looks like just some, some <clears throat> maybe some extraordinary storm that's come through. What is demonic about the storm? Church, you can't just read the Bible. you got to read the Bible. Read the Bible. Yeah. In order to understand that, you've got to put this in context. And I think to really grab a hold of this, we've got to move forward just a couple of verses. Verses 26 and 27. And as we read these verses, this is a whole new story. Don't look like if your, your Bible is taken into the topic. And if you read in your Bible, you'll see that there was a time that it said Jesus calmed the storm. But you've got to understand when he got them in the boat, they were going somewhere. Where were they going? The other side. Okay. So they're going to the other side. What's on the other side? Gadara. A place, a forbidden place, that ain't nothing but pigs and graveyards. And as we see this, it says, and they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. This is what they found when they got there. And he went forth to the land, and there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils a long time, and were no, wore no clothes, and neither abide in any house but in the tombs. Let me just give you a picture of this. There was this man that was so demonically possessed that they had taken him from his home. And they didn't know what to do with him. What little bit 
the modern medicine and what little bit of therapeutic value that they had in that culture could not fix him. And this man, it didn't matter when they chained him up, he would break the chain. He was so miserable and so defeated, he was in the tombs cutting himself, trying to find God's comfort from these demonic spirits that were on the inside of him. And when the disciples and Jesus roll up on Gadara, they get out of the boat and hear Jesus step off. And here this guy comes out of the tombs, the Bible says. And when he comes running toward Jesus, his hair every which way, scars all over his body, he runs right up to him and he says, Who are you? And as we begin to see this story unfold, he asked, and Jesus asked him, Well, who are you? And he says, My name is Legion. There's a bunch of us. Like that was going to scare Jesus away. But you've got to understand, Jesus healed this man. To make a long story short, and you say, well, what does this got to do when you go back to our scripture about the storm? This was a spiritual storm that the enemy was trying to hinder the disciples and Jesus from getting to this demonic man so that he could not be healed. And as we think about that in our life, the enemy will place storms in your life to get, make you give up and quit before you get to the place and the purpose and the destiny that God has called us to. Amen. We'll give up on God when the storm comes. Yes. And if we're not careful, that's exactly what will happen. But this was a spiritual storm and sometimes God will give us a boat and that's like the boat to flow through the storm. And sometimes God says you've got to speak to the storm. Sometimes God says in the name of Jesus under the authority of Jesus, I'm telling you today, devil, you will not hinder me from the purpose and the plan and the provision that God has for my life. Sometimes we just have to speak. We just have to speak in the authority in the name of Jesus. Yeah. And as we begin to look at this, that's exactly why they were agitated. And Jesus, it didn't phase him. He walked up and he knew it was a spiritual storm. And he rebuked him. He said, be still. Wait. Sit down. Wind, shut up. Nick. I think about that so many times. Think about our life. You begin to look at this, and we begin to put this into, <laughs> into perspective in our life. This storm was demonic. The enemy was hindered. And what, what we've got to understand, you say, well, that really worked in our life. Matthew's got from chapter 18, and I'm going to close with this. The Bible says this. Verily I say to you, most of you shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and also whatever you shall loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, two of you shall agree on earth, or such as anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them, <coughs> so my Father which is in heaven. You begin to look at this. And as we begin to take this a step further, we're two or three together in my name, I'm there, I'm in the midst. And as we understand this, Jesus on the inside of us. Yeah. That power in the thought. We have watered down Jesus so much, church, till we have just become prisoners of our lives. We have got to a place in our life where we feel like <clears throat> that we have just, we just have to settle for the natural. We just have to settle for the logic. We just have to settle for the rational. And we will, we will not take a step in faith and believe that we serve a supernatural God that's bigger than any want or need that we have. We have watered Him down to so much that we have become privy to the fact that we think we can't accomplish things in the name of Jesus anymore. And as we look at this passage of Scripture, that's exactly what Jesus is trying to tell them. He said, listen guys, where's your faith? Where's your faith? Some storms you build a boat in. And the wisdom of God will get you through it. Others you stand under the authority of Jesus Christ and say to the enemy, you're not going to block me today. You're not going to block me from the promise and the provision that you have on the last Joel, Jack, you need to come on and give us a song of invitation. I don't know where you're at this morning. What's going on in your life. But I do believe this. I believe there may be somebody here this morning in this capacity of worship. God spoke to your heart. 
God spoke to your heart and He's told you that you need to be saved. That you need to surrender your life to Christ. Give your life and receive the precious blood of Jesus Christ that He shed on the cross of Calvary for you. This is how the devil works. You got that, that into your spirit. All of a sudden, the enemy began to put a storm in your life. And he began to let you look back on other storms in your life. He began to let you look back on places in your life. And he began to say, yeah, that all sounds good. But there's no way that will work for you. Because there's no way God can love you. Because there's no way with all the stuff that you've done, and all the things that you've said, and all the places you've been, and all the garbage that you have in your life, there's no way that God could love you like that. Let me just speak to the storm this morning and say, Satan, get out of this life. Get out of their life. That they might be able to know the goodness of God. That they might be able to step into the parameters of God and know beyond the shadow of doubt. There ain't no devil in hell this morning. It's too big for God to move out of the way if you can be saved. Amen. Know that this morning. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, don't believe the lies of the enemy. Stand up and believe the authority of God. That you can be saved. Romans 10 9 says it this way. If you believe it in your heart and confess it with your mouth, you can be saved this morning. Don't let the devil cheat you out of a victory this morning. Don't let him send a storm in your life that gets you to a point you can't believe the goodness and the graciousness and the mercy and the blessings of God. Maybe you're here and you've already done that. Already given your life. <coughs> But maybe you just surrendered to life. Maybe you just surrendered to the status quo. Maybe you just allowed the cares of this world to just put you in a place and just put their hand on the top of you. And you just say, well, I don't, I'm just going to do what's logical. I'm just going to do what comes natural. I'm just going to do what just seems good and what I can accomplish. And I'm not going to take any risk. And I'm not going to step out in vain. And you know, as we begin to do that, that's why the church is smothered today. That's why we have put Jesus in the corner. And we've just kind of come complacent around the world, across America. But if we want to be the church of the living God, we're going to have to step out of the box. And we're going to have to step into the parameters of God and say, God, I believe that you are still supernatural this morning. I believe that you're bigger than any war or need that I can lay in this altar this morning. I believe that I can step out in faith and you'll meet me in this point of need in my life. And God, you'll help me. I believe that. I've gone as far as I can go. I've rode as hard as I can row. And as I look up, the waves are still crashing. And the wind is still blowing. And I pray this morning that you'll find your way to this altar. And you'll seek a God that is still supernatural. And He will speak peace into your situation this morning. He will speak hope into your situation this morning. He will speak encouragement and inspiration into your situation this morning. And you might have come in deep down, burdened down, and shackled down. But you'll walk out of here today knowing that we serve a God that's bigger than anything that we can lay before. I pray this morning that you don't leave the same way you came in. If you need salvation this morning, please make your way to this altar. If you are burdened and shackled this morning, would you make your way to this altar and let God be God in the house this morning. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for being God. Thank you that you're not just a natural God that's full of wisdom. Oh, but God, you are the supernatural God that's full of the Holy Spirit. And God, because of that Holy Spirit, and because of what we did, and because of what you did, you give us that understanding, and you indwell us. God, we have that Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, and we're born again, but blood all believers of the true and living God. And God, we have that on the inside. And God, let us not snuff it out, let us not quench it, but let us step out in faith this morning and exercise the power of the Holy Spirit, and let God be God in the house this morning. God, I pray if he's going into the sound of my voice, that the devil has, has quickened their, 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 their life and has put it back and pushed them back and put them down. God, I pray that you'll come and you'll quicken it in the other direction and you'll let them know that you love them this morning and that they, by, by, your, by faith through grace, they can be saved this morning if they will trust you and give their life to you and receive that free gift of salvation. God, move in the house this morning. 
Whatever your desire is, move in the house this morning. We give you liberty to do your perfect work. We love you, we thank you, we praise you. We ask all these favors and blessings in Jesus' precious name.